what I'd like to demonstrate today is a new quality tool uh, that's now being used more and more in industry. That is using artificial intelligence to examine and pass or reject product. And so I'd like to show you, uh, I'll show you a short video on just an example of where it's used. And then I'm gonna walk you through a very simple model that I created using um, the Teachable Machine, which is an artificial intelligence system that's um, made available by Google, which is really cool, super, super easy to use, creates a neural network. Uh, so I'll show you the sort of the steps on creating it and how that works and what you can do with it. And, um, and then it's good to, that you're here because this is your next assignment is to basically reproduce what I'm showing you today. Um, nice fancy flying arrows, isn't that lovely? Okay, so I'm gonna demonstrate a modern inspection method. We'll create a defect library. I use my cell phone camera, so this is really nice. It's all you're going to need for your own project is just to use your own cell phone. I use an article of clothing. Um, you don't have to do that. I'll show you that uh, you have lots of choices about what you can do. We'll use a neural network to recognize defects. And then I'll drop my data into Minitab, because uh, this is a professional quality engineering course. So we'll actually take a look at the results um, mathematically and see uh, how they look. And as I say, this will be um, part of your next, or this will be your next assignment in this course. So, uh, I found a couple of, um, so this is uh, from the National Institute of Health that in an article last year pointed out, right, so quality management is a fundamental component of manufacturing process. That's good for you guys because you're looking for jobs in quality management. Uh, so it's not going away as a profession. But to meet these growth targets, manufacturers are increasing their production rate. And, and so that's absolutely true, whether it's through robotics or other kind of automated um, production or even just pure lean tools and making things more efficient and increasing output rates. You have to compete with bigger and bigger companies um, using robotics and so on and so production rates have to increase. And, and so what happens though is the rate of production of product starts to outpace the rate at which a quality department can inspect the product or um, if you're a more progressive company where the operators themselves inspect their own product rather than quality inspectors, that's great, but you don't want operators or people spending more time inspecting the product than making it. And certainly if you have a robotic system, you don't have human operators, you can't do this sort of visual inspection uh, in a traditional way. So we have to start to use newer techniques for, uh, for product inspection. With a modern trend of artificial intelligence, industrial firms are looking to use deep learning based computer vision technology during the production cycle itself to automate material quality inspection. So that's what I'm gonna to demonstrate to you today is to do exactly this. This machine is the first machine that will actually grade different types of produce on a consistent basis. So for example, one inspector might say that a certain package of strawberries is bad, another might say that they're good. This machine will make the exact same determination every single time. Today, over 50% of all fruits and vegetables goes to waste because of the inefficient and inaccurate distribution. So of 100 strawberries picked on the field, only 50 on average make it into the kitchen. So the idea of inspecting groceries in an automated manner was born when machine learning and Amazon Fresh uh, came together and we were brainstorming ideas. If we, for example, could uh, predict the quality of uh, groceries, if we can predict if something is turning bad soon, uh, also if we can uh, make some statements about uh, the taste, like if a strawberry is uh, sweet or not. 
The solution we, can, we came up with uh, consists of an entire system with hardware and software where the associates receiving fruits and vegetables in the warehouse will place the items on the trays and it will go through a set of uh, cameras and sensors um, that combined with machine learning techniques will uh, be able to decide whether we, uh, the, the items are good to be sold or not. Right now, my team and I are actually teaching the machine to go through and understand what is a good piece of fruit versus a bad piece of fruit. I'll just jump in and say that this is going to be the um, same kind of an exercise that we're going to do together in a moment once this video is completed. So just as they're doing, though, you have to teach the system what good product looks like and you teach the system what bad product looks like and then the artificial intelligence model takes over. One of the reasons why research in this area is so important is that in food, in fresh food, the quality plays a very essential role to the purchase decision. This is only the beginning of the project and the system will improve over time as we uh, take more and more decision and can integrate the feedback from our customers. And also we want to expand the number of uh, fruits and vegetables that we can inspect with the system. Uh, so it'll come out at the end of the video, but this is in 2017. So uh, at the time of recording this, this is only three years old. And this is Amazon, compared with Amazon Fresh, just prototyping a system and, and bringing it into play. So although vision systems have been around for many, many years, the idea of artificial intelligence and machine learning to detect good product versus bad is relatively new, to, new uh, quite new. And so there's many, many opportunities for um, someone getting into this field to apply their knowledge in industry. So this is really worth learning. So that's pretty cool. What do you guys? So what do you guys think? Uh, using artificial intelligence to inspect fruit sold by Amazon and Amazon Fresh. So let's run a demonstration. So what I use for this exercise is just a plain, um, ba -ba -ba, just a plain polo shirt. So this is a shirt I bought recently. So it's brand new. Uh, when I did this exercise, I'd never worn it yet. So I, you know, I wanted to, I thought it would be all nice and clean. Uh, part of the reason I chose it is it's got a really nice, just a simple fabric or fabric uh, pattern, like it's a cotton weave. Um, so it's just got straight plain stripes on it and it looks like a wonderful shirt. I didn't spend a ton of money on it, so not necessarily the highest quality. Um, so if you're doing this exercise at home, you want to pick something that's got a nice, simple, pattern to it. The more complicated the, the object that you're trying to scan, the more complicated it is to pick out something that's defective versus something that's good. So I've got some pictures here. These, these would be good choices. The stripey thing are very simple repeating patterns, small repeating patterns like this. Or if you have lots of colors or complex patterns or funny weaves, uh, this exercise gets a little more difficult. But Hey, like Amazon did, and I'm saying down here, you could use a basket of fruit, or you could uh, a bucket of bolts if you have them, or bow ties, or paper airplanes, or whatever you want. So this is not limited to doing textiles in any way. This is just the what I use for my demonstration. Okay, and the tools are really simple. You. Um, I did this whole exercise with my uh, cell phone and the camera that was on my cell phone. Um, I used PowerPoint to organize all the pictures. You need an internet connection to access the neural network model. Um, and then finally, to do the analysis, you're going to use Minitab. Um, OK. When I did this the first time, this is this is the picture that I get off of my camera. This this image, so tons and tons of stripes, and um, as I was taking pictures of it, you can kind of see here on the screen, um, sort of down in this area down here. There's a little bit of a defect where the the um, 
there's a little extra blue stitching or it's out of place. And so what I found is if you zoom in on the camera, you can find things like this, the little extra stitching that's here, or in some cases, there's a white stitch that travels across the blue stripe. Now, when you're wearing the shirt, you can't see any of these defects, but if you were responsible for producing the textile for this shirt, uh, you would wanna fix this kind of thing, right? Like this is a genuine defect if you're the textile manufacturer. So uh, you do have to satisfy yourself at the beginning of this exercise that you do in fact have some defects um, yes, uh, that, are, that are available to take pictures of, right? And, and your camera has to be able to be good enough to actually capture the defect to be able to see it. Okay, so what I did is I uh, took a picture of the area that has a defect, and that's, I mean, you gotta hold your camera nice and steady so it's nice and focused. I, for the most part, tried to center the defect in the image. Um, uh, some nice daylight or a bright light helps, okay? And what you need to do is capture a fair number of these. The more, the better. Um, I'm saying here at least 14, uh, probably closer to 20 would be better. If this was a, if you were actually doing this for a, a commercial use, like for a real application, you would probably try to collect over 100 defect pictures, right? But, but for purposes of this exercise, uh, 12, 14, 16 was plenty enough for this for this project to work. Um, it, so what I did is I took a picture of um, an area of my shirt that had a defect in it. Then I zoomed, I, I loaded into PowerPoint. I cropped the image so that it showed a single stripe and the defect. And then I just copy and pasted that same image and then shifted the crop so that it showed a good part of the shirt. So for every for every image that I took of a defect, I came along for the ride free at least one picture of um, good textile or an area that doesn't have any defects on it. Okay. All right. So then, uh, so this is this is the working PowerPoint that I'm actually showing you. Um, is each one of these then is a separate picture of a, of a different area of the shirt that I have, each one showing slightly different kinds of defects. So some are those spots where the, I can sort of zoom in here, right, where the, um, the white stitching crossed over the fabric. Um, they weren't so obvious all the time. Some were just sort of partially overstitched. Um, I had found one little spot with a little red colored stain on it. Yeah, so different spots where the blue was, the blue fabric or the blue thread was wrong or somewhere the white thread was wrong. So all kinds of variety. What, one thing I found is um, I had to decide how much of this textile pattern to show for each image. So the first time that I did this exercise, I made a whole bunch of pictures that look like this. And it turned out that the difference between a bunch of these pictures with little tiny defects in them and pictures without any defects were really hard to spot. Um, Cause it's right. It's very, very small or the defect is a very, very small percentage of the total image where if I zoomed in like this, uh, like I'm showing in this shot here, the defect is quite a bit larger and a lot more obvious. So when uh, for your project, for your, version of this, whatever product you're taking a picture of, whether it's fruit, textiles, or whatever you have for your imagination. When you zoom into your picture, when you take your picture and zoom in, that's my advice, just make sure that the defect is obvious in the defect images. Okay, so this is the idea. You have to create kind of a library then, a whole bunch of pictures that show defects, then you also need a whole bunch of pictures without any defects. Uh, I also discovered um, by trial and error, when you're taking pictures with your phone, you're sometimes moving it around. And some of my pictures, um, 
you can actually see when I took the pictures, depending on how you're holding your camera, uh, sometimes it thought that vertical stripes up was the camera up and sometimes vertical stripes across. And so the problem with feeding this into your model, pictures like this, is um, now it thinks that, that maybe it's the stripes that are going vertically that is the defect, not the details of it. So that's when I had to um, correct all my images, rotate them so that they were all facing in the same direction. And, and this is how you would be if you were installing a camera on a textile mill, all the fabric would be coming across in the same direction. The camera would always be in the same orientation. So it would be nice and consistent like this. So, so this is something you have to do when you're doing your images is like I have all my defects. It's a single blue stripe in the middle with a defect. All my good images are a single blue stripe in the middle going horizontally the same way. The images don't need to be big. My the images that I have saved on my computer um, are literally where I've just saved the picture out of PowerPoint like this. And they ended up being about uh, roughly 96 by 96 pixels. Not all my images are the same size. I wasn't too particular about that, and I don't think that affected my test. Um, okay, then you need um, a third set of images. And um, so these have to be a mix of defect and non-defective pictures, and they can't be the same ones. You, they, it can't be any of these or any of these. It has to be a new set or a different set of defects and a different set of good pictures. Um, and what I'll show you in a minute is we'll, we're going to use the first two libraries to train the model and then we're going to use these test images to check the model. If you check the model with your training images, it'll guaranteed come up with 100% perfect. That's sort of the nature of uh, the AI system. Okay, so then you end up saving your images to three separate folders. Um, I have. I saw I saved as pictures. I created three folders in my computer, a defect, a good, and a test, and each one is full of the, the appropriate pictures. Okay, then, um, so this is the cool part here. So let me go over to um, my web browser. So this is um, a website called Teachable Machine, whoops. This is called Teachable Machine with Google.com. But if you just Google Teachable Machine, and it will guarantee to get you here. Uh, so this is a really cool um, website that they've created. And the people that created this Teachable Machine um, were also contributors to TensorFlow. And if you're into AI and machine learning, and I know some of you here are, you, you know what TensorFlow is. It's a it's sort of, I think, the de facto standard in sort of neural network building if you're, if you're creating your own neural networks, doing your own programming in Python or so on. So, right, so this is a very stable, very sound um, system that's using common now programming elements. And um, okay, so if you want to use it, um, you click get started and they have different kinds of things that you can do. It, you can set up a neural network for images, which is what we're gonna use. You can set up a neural network for sounds uh, where it will recognize different sounds. And they have a different one, which is kind of fun that um, you can pose in front and it will actually recognize what what pose you're in, whether you're standing or your hands are up or you're shouting or cheering or what have you. Okay, but we wanna do an image project. So this is the screen you get. And, and once you've got your images uh, taken and stored, then this becomes a really trivial exercise. So I'm gonna define my first class of product as uh, defective. And I'm gonna upload from my computer, bah, bah, bah. find it. Um,
So here's my collection of um, defective images. So there's 17 images loaded up. Then my second class is good or defect free. Well, I'll just say good, that's fine. And upload images to that. You don't have to have the same number. You can see I've got 18 good images and 17 defective images. You could have 24 of these and 50 of those. It, it, so they don't have to be balanced. Uh, 17, is, 17 and 18 are kind of skimpy. If you read the documentation for this, they really do recommend 20 or 30 or 40 or 50 images, okay? But for purposes of demonstration, this is fine. So now, uh, here's where it becomes trivial is you click the training button. And so it is now going to look at the defective images and try to understand what makes them look different than the good images. And when you're done, the model is now trained and ready to use. Uh, so that took like moments. You can show, you can do the whole thing based on webcam images, or you can do it based on stored images. So I'm choosing to use this using stored images. So I've, I've made sure that the input is on and um, set to file. And so now I can choose from my test images, any, any of my images, there's one that looks good. And you can see what it's doing. It says there's a 22% chance that that is an image of a defect, but a 78% chance that it's a, uh, that it's a good image. So in that case, that's a good decision. Let's try another one. Here's one with a really obvious defect. Boom, and you can see, so the odd, right? Like the, the image uh, clearly showing a defect. It is not the same as any one of these. It's never seen this picture before. I've not shown it that image in, in any of these. There might be similar ones, but never this image. And yet it is 100% confident that that is a defect. Now, that one's a really obvious one. If we choose one of these ones where maybe it's just this here, here's a little one that's maybe marginal. There we go. It says, hmm. 54% chance that it's a defect, 46% confidence that it's good. So it's not just making a go no go decision or a yes or a pass or fail decision. It's also giving you uh, sort of a confidence level, which is really useful, right? If you're trying to use this in a commercial application, you could program that. And maybe if you have something that falls, um, say less, whatever number you choose, less than a 70%, confidence of it being a defect or less than 70% confidence of it being good. Maybe you send it over to a, a human visual inspection line or a, you know, a, a to be checked line and then somebody actually has to pick it up and take a look at it. But the ones that are obvious, kick them in or, or let them go. So it's really as straightforward as that. There's our model, trained it in, in like a minute um, and and it works brilliantly. It does a really good job of identifying uh, defects. Now, not always. And, and so here's a good example. To me, this is a defect. Here's this sort of picked at white fuzzy bit of my textile, but it's saying it's 97% sure that it's good. So if you're the person who's responsible for training this model, you might need to go back and, and, and try to understand, well, why is it think that that's good? And, um, and I would suggest it's probably my own fault because not all of my pictures are perfectly in focus. And so it's already used to seeing a little bit of haziness or fuzziness and thinking that that's okay. So for it, maybe this just looks like this similar to an out of focus good picture, right? So you have to, you have to be a little bit careful on what you're doing. I also recognize that, okay, well, what happens if I send it a picture where the 
where the um, it's a perfectly good piece of fabric, but the um, pattern is on a tilt or an angle. And of course, it's never seen that before. It doesn't belong in the good. So it's clearly in this case, it's chosen to be safe and saying, I'm sure that's defective. Um, you know, so that's a bad decision. So I would need to either control my test system to make sure that it never saw an angled line like that. The camera and, and material were always fixed and feeding at a, at a constant angle relative to each other, or recognize that that's gonna be rejected as a defect. Um, but let's see, another, I don't know, another stretch of good. Well, uh, that one's a little blurry. So these are, these are not brilliant images. So, um, but certainly on something that's a bit more obvious. The other thing that you can do, and I'm not gonna get into the details of it, but you can also change some of the parameters. And so if you're into machine learning and building neural networks, then you know there's different kinds of models, different decision trees. Um, you can use random forests, all these different sorts of things. Um, and here they give some explanation of some things that you can change and you can uh, read more about what model it's using. Uh, so there's a little opportunity for you to play within this, but not, I mean, this isn't meant to, to have at your disposal every potential neural network imaginable. Um, okay. And for those of you who are into the sort of the programming side, you can also, let me move this out of the way, you can export your model and uh, so you can send it out to uh, TensorFlow or um, in, uh, in uh, JS format um, or in uh, the Keras H5 format. So if you're doing um, uh, like programming in Python, for example, instead of JS, then you can capture whichever version of it that you like. And, and remarkably, that's it. That's the entire model um, uh, using the using the TensorFlow package. So, you know, programming of these things is is not overly complex. Um, again, I'm showing you a simplified version. Uh, and, and you can see in my little demonstration, I have some false negatives and false positives. Uh, so you're absolutely right. One of the things, so I, um, I do want to point out that uh, how this is different than a, than traditional vision um, quality systems. Historically, what had to happen is you had to program in or code what a good product looked like. Like you had to do sort of image recognition uh, and and program in what defines a good image and what defines a bad image. And, and what is evolving here with using machine learning is I haven't told it, I haven't had to program anything. The, the neural network looked at my images, compared good ones and bad ones, and figured out for itself how to distinguish them from each other. Um, so that is a leap forward and and for me, this makes it a lot more useful or usable for different industries. So that instead of having uh, to pay a great deal of money to have a company program your visual inspection system, um, I, I would suggest that this starts to bring it within the realm um, of the possible to do in-house. You know, that if a company had a smart intern, for example, on its staff, uh, like if this was your job, you could learn how to do this and you could program the vision system yourself, building, a, building on a neural network principle. One of the other things then that's beneficial to this kind of system, and, and I, it's beyond my demonstration, um, but you build an active learning system. So as it runs, it can see more good product and see more bad product and and you can teach it or you can allow the system to continue to learn so uh, it it would go beyond the 
set of samples that you give it to begin with to say, these are defective, these are good, and I'm never gonna show you another defective, and I'm never gonna show you another good, and every decision you ever make is gonna have to be based on this small library. So the, the even more sophisticated um, idea of machine learning is this active machine learning uh, or ongoing or continuous machine learning, all kinds of names for it, um, where the system evolves. It continues to learn and learn and learn and learn and get better and better and better as, as it's seeing product. Or uh, So for example, those ones that might come up as questionable, it would ask an operator to decide or to make a decision and you'd put the green button or the red button, as a tr like a trained person would say, well, that one's bad. And it would add that to its intelligence. It would add that to its model rejig and say, okay, so now I've learned something. Um, so it's, it's trainable or teachable, which is fantastic. Really, really fantastic. Um, and you're right. You brought up the point where um, sometimes it's difficult to see the de defect, right? They're really small or the geometry is complicated. And, but there are techniques on, um, on working around that. Everything from like two dimensional vision systems with uh, at least two cameras instead of one. And then you can get dimensions uh, like a, by looking at a part in stereo. Um, uh, lighting is surprisingly a big part of this. You can shine even with a, a single dimensional camera, like a one, dimension, one camera system. If you shine a light across the part instead of straight down on the part, then things that with higher uh, height or elevation off the surface cast longer shadows and the system can be trained to pick up on the shadows of the product instead. There's also a very common thing, um, I know it as zebra lighting, where the light is, uh, the light that's shining on the object under test is actually um, alternating light and dark, light and dark bands in stripes. And it's remarkable how, how much that helps a vision system detect defects and defect, detect good parts. Um, so there's all kinds of techniques that, that make this an even better and more robust, reliable technology for, for quality systems. Um, okay, so you can, uh, you can export, I wanna just, final word before I leave the screen, you can export your model to use it somewhere else. Um, but um, for this upcoming assignment, um, and I'm giving you a choice of projects to do, and this is one of them, one of your choices. Um, I want you to create a defect library, just as I've shown you here, you're gonna to get to exactly the same screen that I have. You're gonna show that you're testing a part um, and it's coming up with a good decision. And then I would like you to download your whole project as a file, and that will save um, basically everything that you see on your screen. Um, and then you can submit that file. Okay, so that's the download project, this file over here. I think I've got that laid out in the instructions too. In the next part, and I'll go through this kind of quickly too. Um, you've all used Minitab now, and uh, right? And you're experts at Minitab. Uh, so you know that it's actually a fairly straightforward package to use, but pretty powerful at doing some analysis. So the professional next step is to evaluate, is this model any good? If, if, you know, how, how does it perform? Um, so in Minitab, for this kind of a defect analysis, um, whether we're just choosing pass fail, defect or good, so that's considered to be an attribute um, analysis. So I would suggest using the assistant, uh, it makes life easier with a newer Minitab, under measurement systems analysis, um, and it'll come up with this choice. We're not doing a measurement, but an appraisal. Right? We're not measuring the defect, we're just appraising the piece of material and saying it's good or bad. Um, you can set up the study and analyze the data. And so in setting up the study, it'll create a worksheet for you. That's a, always a good place to start. Um, define the number of praisers. Now for my exercise, I did three. I did the, um, the teachable machine, uh, artificial intelligence. Uh, then I looked at the parts myself and um, actually got my daughter to 
look at the parts as well. So there's three appraisers. We each check them twice. Um, I had 16 test items, uh, difference between good and defective. Um, then as a standard, so by standard, it's saying, what is the true value? So I created the image library of tests, so I'm the official standard setter. So I said, item number one is defective, number two was good, three and four were defective, and so on. And you have to populate that in this screen here. Um, Another way to get to the same spreadsheet, I wanted to be thorough, not everybody likes to use the assistant, is if you go to mini tab, stat, quality, create attribute analysis worksheet, it's to the same, effectively the same place, but some of the input screens are a little bit different. So um, it allows you to randomize or not. Uh, you can choose not to randomize. So if this is your choice on what you want to, what method you want to follow, it gets you to the same place. And it creates basically a spreadsheet where uh, in Minitab where you can key in your results. And so um, for the teachable machine, you load your image into it and record whether it says it was good or defective and put that in the results column. Um, and uh, if you're doing this, if you're choosing to do this as your assignment, then I would okay, uh, say it's okay, I've said here get two students, but in the assignment I'm saying it's all right if you just get one other student um, to be your human appraiser. So you're gonna have my friend and type in their results. So then, um, now in my case, and you don't have to do this, uh, I also wrote in what percentage and uh, that the machine learning model appraised and so for item 10 the standard was it was good like i had decided that it was actually a good part but the computer said it was a defective part and was 96 percent sure um okay so once you've got the data just keyed into mini tab then you can do this attribute agreement analysis and you have to show it uh, what columns all your data is in. And so you have to just complete the, uh, the fields here, really simple. And, and it gives you a number of graphs. So I've reproduced um, what I thought were the most useful or most interesting graphs from the mini tab analysis here into my PowerPoint. Um, is the overall percentage accuracy acceptable? So it looked at all three people, me, my daughter, and the computer, together as operators, as um, inspectors, and said, overall, you're about 73% accurate. Meaning 73% of the time, you, we collectively guessed the right thing or appraised the part properly. And so that's pretty good. Um, now, what's interesting is, and I'm kind of glad it came out that way, I happen to be the best at judging my own images you notice I wasn't even perfect. So I had decided that things were good or bad, but when I later looked at them in a random order, I actually only agreed with my original standard 84% of the time. Okay, uh, my daughter who is not a trained quality technician still got 78% and um, okay, so the teachable machine in the end only matched the standard 56% of the time. So that's not brilliant, right? Um, but this was very few samples and, and this is where you have to look at what went wrong and make it better. Right? This is a, the job of a quality professional. Um, this uh, mini tab also shows you a percent appraiser by standard. So for the good parts, I was really good at picking out the good ones. Um, my uh, daughter was okay. You know, it's still good, about 80%. Um, and the teachable, machi teachable machine was down around 40%. So it mis uh, misjudged good parts more often than not, where it was much better at kicking out defective parts and had a good sense of what defects were like. So this is 
to me, this is sort of a fail safe, right? When it made a mistake, it was rejecting good parts. I would rather a computer reject good parts than pass bad parts is no customer gets harmed or gets shipped a bad product. Um, one thing though, uh, so that is in the favor of the computer models, here is um, saying the percentage rated both ways. So I judge my parts twice, my daughter judged the same parts twice, and the computer judged the same parts twice. And you can see from this report that I, for some of my samples, I said it was either good or bad. And my daughter, for some samples, said that it was good or bad. But the computer always made the same decision. And that consistency is really important. If you're working for a company and you, um, uh, you're trying to train somebody on how to do a job, whether it's a machine or a computer, uh, what is very, very difficult to troubleshoot is if they change their mind and, or they're inconsistent. So I would rather have a system like this one that always makes the same decision, even if it's not the right decision all the time, because that you can retrain. It's very difficult to retrain inconsistency. Because, you know, how, how do you do that? Other than sort of shouting at the person and saying, you have to make up your mind and be consistent. Right? Like, it's a very, very difficult thing to actually uh, teach a human to be consistent. So, so this is, a, to me, a distinct advantage that um, computer inspection or, or um, automated inspection through artificial intelligence has over computers. Um, and I'm interested in your own opinions, but, but to me, three big things that I saw out of this is that the, first off, the artificial intelligence model was almost trivial to build. Right? You load a bunch of pictures and you click model or train. Um, and to me, that's kind of mind blowing because when you click train, the thing is building a neural network, an artificial intelligence neural network based on a bunch of visual images. Um, and it, and it took like a minute on an average PC. So you don't need high powered computing. It doesn't take days. Um, and again, this is a very, very small, very trivial model. So of course it'll take longer um, in real life, but I can, I can live with that. If it goes from minutes to hours, um, you know, imagine the power that this thing is, is chugging through. So that's, that's one thing that I thought was extremely interesting out of this. Um, also, the artificial intelligence system performed fairly well, given that I only gave it 16 samples. Um, in the real world, we'd feed it with much more samples and there would be um, a lot more accurate in making its decisions. So with just a, a small handful of product or examples, it's already making decent decisions. So that's also cool. And the AI model is 100% consistent, which is definitely useful and a, and a distinct advantage over humans. Um, all right, let, let me open it up to you guys. What, uh, what did you sort of see out of that that you thought was interesting? Because uh, I think, uh, uh, a man with uh, the performance is not uh, stable all the time. Uh, when you start your shift, you're, uh, you are fresh, then after one hour, then two hours, then after break. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But yeah. the machine ha doesn't have this tradition, just uh, its uh, performance is uh, stable all the time, 24 7. Right. As long as the camera is working. Um, and it's and the and the light bulb stays on. Yeah. Yeah. Right from the from the beginning of the of the run to the end of the run, it it's always on the job, right? Yeah. It's not. Yeah. It's not thinking about its grocery list. <laughs> yeah. I think uh, for such critical uh, positions, uh, AI is much better. Um. Yeah, and you, so this is, that's a beautiful point that you, um, that you're raising on it. It's, and I'm, and I'm glad you've, you've stated it the way you did. 
you you don't have an inspector this company you know in this fictitious here the company maybe doesn't have an inspector but it has a person who's programming the system and responsible for the system and i would argue that that is kind of a like it's an upgrade right the the person who's programming the system to me has a better job and a higher paying job than the person who was paid to inspect parts all day long of course yeah right so um all kinds of ethical issues and we're going to actually get that get into that um toward the end of this course we're going to talk about these the the societal challenges that come along with all this and, and we'll have a we'll have a bigger discussion about it um but it's a but it's a beautiful you're absolutely right beautiful point there's so many different applications for this um companies are you know more and more companies are using this technology now and um like i think it's getting to a point where it's really only limited by your imagination uh, especially when systems like this can deal with not only visual images but even but you know but sound um i wouldn't be surprised like you could turn temperature data or any other sort of data into something that you can learn through uh, machine learning or artificial intelligence yeah so i think whatever kind of a company you find yourself working for especially if it's a, a little easier to think about in a in a higher volume manufacturing company um but i would suggest that for a lot of manufacturing companies making high volume product they could they could apply this kind of a thing and and uh without a huge and huge investment and they just need a smart engineer on the on the team to to develop it and if you can i think sometimes if all you need to do is come up with a demonstration and then that gives you a budget and a small team and you got a big project and you're mm -hmm. you're set for the next 10 years <laughs> <laughs> another thing like amazon stores is doing it's been doing the research for like a, around 10 years so this in, in amazon stores the customer just walks in picks up the products yeah. and just leaves so that's only based on artificial intelligence so this is the thing you're you're seeing so much more of that and this is why i wanted to, to um show this for you guys because uh, you know, let's see, I'm going to come on back, just move my screen back over here. Artificial intelligence now being used in so many different places, not just in quality inspection, but as, as you say, for, for shopping, recognizing what you're picking off of the shelf, uh, for warehousing and stock control. There's um, scanning systems that just move along, move around the store and scan the shelves and they can see when the wrong product is put in the wrong place or if the pricing is set wrong or the labels aren't turned out properly or if there's a broken bottle on the shelf um so more and more kind of wherever in industry for producers marketing distributing warehousing and service providers you know even just information service providers people are doing insurance um and so on are using more and more in the way of artificial intelligence i actually um have an interesting example insurance so if you can imagine there are insurance companies that are um, playing with using artificial intelligence to help decide how much of a risk the the person is if they're taking out health insurance and so what they do is they have you take a picture like you basically you, you take a selfie shot right you take a picture of yourself and you upload it and using artificial intelligence they can they can see from your photograph for example whether you are overweight male or female whether you're a smoker or not um how fit you are how much muscle tone you have and and it uses those to guide the decision about how much of a health risk you are <laughs> so 
and of course, it, in terms of um, you know imagining uh, or, or looking at pictures of people and you know scanning for uh, terrorists at an airport or smugglers or what have you, the the use of AI now is kind of boundless, and um, and to to me, this is why it's it's important for us to talk about as we're talking about emerging technology in this course, uh, specifically as it relates to the quality field. So of course, AI is an emerging technology for quality, but I think it's a, it's a useful thing for anyone to learn because it's being used in so many places, so many industries, manufacturing and service, um, and, in, and in remarkable ways, so. Okay, so I will, uh, so I'll finish the, this lecture. Um, and uh, I'll save the recording, I'll post it to the course files. I hope you enjoyed seeing the demonstration um, and uh, invite you to enjoy the rest of your week and we'll see you next week in next week's lecture.